tonight. My name is Grant Gallo, um, and I'm going to be talking about building your own routing protocol, leading discussion here with some folks who are in the live stream. Um, so a little background first on who I am and why I'm talking about this. Uh, so I was a network engineer for a number of years. I uh, worked on a community network project called Pseudomesh or People's Open Network in the Bay Area, Oakland. Um, and I also have a background in firmware development and currently work as a firmware developer. Uh, and as part of Pseudomesh, I also started working on a project called Disaster Radio. So Disaster Radio is a long range, low bandwidth uh, network, mesh network powered by the sun, uh, intended for disaster resiliency, disaster scenarios, be distributed easily, quickly, uh, and set up with little to no overhead other than having the device. Um, so for this project, I went about designing a mesh routing protocol for the device. Um, so kind of thought it would be nice to share some of my experiences with that and just uh, be open to discussion if there's people in the chat who are interested in have some questions around routing protocols and want to understand how they work. So first, I guess we'd start by asking, uh, well, first, I want to start with a story, I guess, to ease everyone into it, into the talk, into the discussion, because sometimes people uh, need a little encouragement. So we're going to start with a story about a town. So in the village of Oak Town, there are three friends, Ari, Benny, and Gabby. Now, Ari, Benny, and Gabby like talking, as most friends do. But even more than talking, they like writing, writing letters to one another. Conveniently, they all live one block away from the Oak Town Central Post Office. When Ari wants to send a letter to Benny or Gabby, or Benny wants to send a letter to Gabby or Ari, or any of them want to send a letter to anyone else, they just put a stamp on it and leave it in the mailbox outside of their home. Once a day, their other friend, postal employee Newman, pictured here. Let me see if I can actually draw. Um, uh, once a day, their friend walks the route from the post office to each of their homes to pick up and deliver letters. However, due to recent budget cuts imposed by a dictatorial ruler, the post office began rolling back its services. First, public mailboxes, which used to dot every block, were removed. Then mail sorting machines in perfect working condition were decommissioned. Then postal employee Newman started only walking his route once a week. Suffice to say, Ari, Benny, and Gabby were distraught, not just at the infraction of their civil, li civil liberties and the crippling of a vital public service, but they, how were they to send their precious letters in a timely ma manner? Once a week was far too infrequent for the volume in which our three friends communicate. So they took matters into their own hands. Gabby decided it was quicker to walk to Ari's and drop off letters while Benny had the same idea. One day while delivering Ari letters, Benny and Gabby ran into each other. A light bulb lit up over Gabby's head. What if Benny left his letters for Gabby in Ari's mailbox and Gabby could do the same for Benny? It would save both of them time and save them the walk between their homes. So they devised a system, a protocol for communication, you could say. They drew up tables and created timing diagrams and printed special envelopes just meant for their special system. What's more, they designed so other friends could easily join in as long as they followed the rules. In this way, Ari, Benny, and Gabby, perhaps unwittingly, built their own routing protocol. So they built a routing protocol. But I guess to start with why did they do that or why would someone want to build a routing protocol at all? So there's, exist, there's tons of existing protocols out there, but maybe those protocols aren't adequate for your application. Um, or maybe you want to make it more secure. A routing protocol isn't necessarily inherently more secure. Your own custom routing protocol isn't inherently more secure, but you could make it more secure than existing private protocols by including some built-in encryption or something. Also, it's a great learning experience. 
and um, what is a routing protocol. So it's an agreed upon set of, this is my definition, it is as an agreed upon set of standards to get information from one place to another. And the information could be anything unexpected, just any one or zero, any bit of data, any package, any packet. And the place can be anywhere in the observable universe, pretty much just any location, any spot. Um, so, but how do you do that? So how do you build a routing protocol? Um, so this is the, these are the steps that I followed generally. Um, I don't know if there's people in the room who are interested in looking at one particular part of designing a routing protocol. Um, if so, we can jump to that. Um, and if not, then I can go through and kind of go through each of these one by one. So if there's any objection to that or not. So um, I guess I can just hop right in and start from the beginning of getting a node and what that means and what a node is exactly. So, so what's a node? I mean, a node is not a noun, but it kind of is. So that's the joke there <laughs> is that any person, a node is really any person, place, or thing. So in our little story, Benny was a node. Benny was a point in which his, or rather his mailbox perhaps was the node. So it's any, point that can communicate with another typically identical point or person, place, or thing in the, in the network and connect into a network. So what's a network though? So a network is a collection of nodes, a collection of points connected in some fashion, some manner. So before you can start routing, you need to have a network of nodes that are connected. But why, how should my nodes be organized? If that might be a question that someone come to mind. Why, how, is there standard ways of setting up organizing nodes? And so these are some uh, examples, sort of the three general uh, types of nodes or types of types of networks kind of. Um, a lot of times you'll hear in networking about topologies, network topologies, um, and there's those are a lot more sort of academic, I guess. This is more what how it actually works out a lot of times. So they have there's types of like a ring network or a star topology or a, a bus, um, but really decentralized, decentralized, and distributed are a lot better. Descriptions of what a node or what a network might look like. So centralized obviously has one central point, um, and that could be one point of failure. So that's not really good. A lot of, uh, centralized networks aren't common. I guess they're, they're common, but they're not. No one really designs a true, a purely centralized network. Largely, they might have some. Central point, but they also often have redundancy involved, um, or they have it where it's more of a decentralized, where there is a central node, but then it spans out from that. Um, decentralized is a little bit buzzy. Lots of times you just hear people say something's going to be decentralized and the next great greatest uh, thing. That's not necessarily always a good thing, decentralization. I think it's it, a lot of times people take it as a inherent positive, inherent good, but it can be uh, also a root of problems. So distributed is saying kind of the ideal, and this is in Disaster Radio that we designed with this structure, this distributed structure in mind. Um, so in which every node is connected to as many other nodes as possible around it. Um, to create the most resilient network uh, and the most equitable and equal network, 
where every node really, there's no hierarchy involved. So, so once you have your nodes talking, uh, organized, how do you get them talking? Um, so like a conversation with someone, how do you start a conversation? You introduce yourself, you say your name, you tell your, tell someone your name. So you need to be able to identify uh, other nodes in the network. And to do that, you need an address. So an address is, you know, seems pretty straightforward when you think about the physical world, you know, where do you live? What's your address? And this is, you know, if this is Benny's address in Oaktown, it is, that's how you would route a letter to, to Benny, is you put a stamp on it and write on it, 1445 Madison Avenue. Um, in computers, you need, they're a little bit more uh, abstracted or esoteric, I guess. And often represented with numbers or hexadecimal as Mac addresses are hexadecimal. And this is just kind of a variety of examples. Um, so um, how long should your address be? How many addresses do you need? So, uh, yeah. So, really, when you talk about addresses um, and how long uh, address should be, you really should ask how many addresses do you need. Um, so in this case, uh, in zip codes in the United States are only five decimals. And why is that? So that's your address space. It gives you this many possible uh, zip codes. So, and then this is just other examples. And if you saw back here for disaster radio, what I, what we, used or what we originally I designed it to have um six to be longer but then because of the limitations of the device it made more sense to shorten it it wasn't necessary to have really that long of an address and that many addresses available so it was shortened um, to what that is right there. Okay, so once you have an address, what do you do with it? And uh, so a uh, so a packet. Um, once you have an address. You need to be able to make a packet to send to someone. Um, and that is a, in the real world, it's a letter or a package or something. In computers, it's a serialized sequence of information. Um, so there's a packet for Penny. And So your header is the stuff you write on the envelope. So once you have, so in this packet example, you write who it's from and who it's going to. And then you, and then you, uh, that's an uh, example of what the header is. I can, I can show examples also of, uh, TCP IP headers or UDP headers or uh, the disaster radio header. So it's it's a, you know, you can see, we can look at real examples um, in computers, what are used. So then this is a drawing of packet encapsulation. So headers, um, Headers are great, but they need to be attached to something or be in front of something. That's why they're called a header. So they 
in this drawing, the payload is the first Russian doll, and then the TCP would actually, and this, it's kind of, this isn't quite right, this cartoon, because really TCP is just a header, not nothing on the you know bottom. So you just put the TCP on top, and same with IP. We put IP address on top, or the IP header on top, and then you put all that inside the Mac, which is more of a frame. So by doing that, you encapsulate the packet and allow it to be sent to the correct place. Now this is in traditional networking, IP networking for the you know, uh, just typical internet. Um, and I, 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 for disaster radio, I looked a lot at both TC, both Mac and IP as kind of inspirations because for the LoRa network um, that I was, the LoRa transceiver I was using didn't have any existing um, data link protocol. So layer two is called the data link layer after the physical layer in the OSI model. And in that you, so you you have a physical connection, but you don't, there was no addressing, right? like there's, there's, there's some things out there for LoRa transceivers, which is the technology that Disaster Radio uses, but there wasn't really anything that did what we wanted to do with mesh meshing and uh, distributed networking. So we made our own protocol, made our own essentially data link protocol, layer two protocol uh, to give an address to a node. Um, so now you can send packets so assuming you know you've gotten to the point where you have two nodes talking, um, and have addresses, you're sending packets of information between those two nodes, then how do you keep track of all those addresses that you have? So if you have more friends, more nodes come to you, how do those how do you handle that? How do how do other nodes and how do the nodes your your already talking to how do they handle it also so it's becomes a recursive question of how you keep track of these addresses so this is benny's address book which shows that he lives one hop away from ari and gabby lives one hop away on franklin so he's keeping track of that and if it's a little antiquated i don't know how many people keep address book it, books or phone books anymore but this is a example of that situation so um what is a routing table um so it can be a list of possible destinations or it is a list of possible destinations how to get to them and it's kept up to date between messages you know, this is, i don't know if to ask a question to the room if people are interested in uh participating if anyone has an idea what the difference is between ooh, proactive and reactive how do i undo that so there's there's a lot of different styles of routing. Oh, there's type of color. But if anyone has any idea what the difference is between a proactive routing uh, and reactive routing. What? Gary, nothing. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, so in this case, I guess uh, proactive routing is the idea that a uh, table that, so nodes actively send out their routing table and tell people who they're connected to. So by telling everyone, these are my neighbors, they're actively going out there, they're using special packets to do that. And reactive routing actually builds that functionality of telling who you're connected to into packets as they're routed. So as you send a packet to your neighbor, you say, you know, I or your neighbor forwards a packet for you, they pay attention to who they're forwarding it to and say, oh, I have a route to this person. So I'm going to make note of that. And I'm going to update my routing table accordingly as I'm, as I'm working and I'm going to use the packets that I'm forwarding with to keep track of how good my connection is or to you know keep track of what's if there's a new route that's shorter um 
so in disaster radio, I originally started just going with proactive routing and it is, it, it's easy. The reason I, I did that way, because when you don't actually have traffic running on networking, you're just kind of testing. It's nice to have that kind of special message getting, getting sent to make sure you're building your routing tables correctly. In a network where people are using the the it more using there's more traffic on it, reactive becomes better because there's no you don't have the overhead of the special packets. So in this you have the special packets um, that take up uh, bandwidth or airtime in the network, and reactive doesn't have that. Just it, it's all built in. So. Um, um, Grant, uh, yes. just to get caught up with the live stream chat, there are a few questions here. Oh, that's great. Um, could another software use the network to exchange messages like devices can auto discover each other on a normal network? Uh, so that's one question. And is there some kind of list of devices on the network somewhere? Can, so what was the first? Um, could another software use the network to exchange messages like devices can auto discover each other on a normal network? Oh, uh, I'm, uh, is it at, in a disaster radio network? Is it, I'm not totally sure I understand the question completely. Um, as far as another, I, I guess another software could interface with the network if it, if it were able to, uh, if it knew the protocol. Um, in the case of, of disaster radio, if it's specific to disaster radio, that network is uh, happening on the on a LoRa uh, radio frequency. So 915 megahertz is the uh, frequency that in the United States it operates at. Um, there's other regulations in Europe and uh, North and, and Australia and Asia and every region has its has different regulations on it. But um, so if if you have a device that can communicate at that frequency and the same uh, and the same modulation scheme as LoRa, so LoRa is really more of just a modulation scheme than a, a protocol necessarily. And if you can communicate at that, then and then you. You could any software could in, to could interface with the network, um, and I guess what was the other second question? Yeah, the second part is: uh, Is there some kind of list of devices on the oh. network? Oh no! It, so there's as far as disaster radio, there's no, there hasn't been a deployment of real devices yet because we're still working on the prototype. So it's a uh, not there's no map out. Um, and that's something as, as far as mapping is concerned in, in disaster radio, it would be more done by people who are deploying them. So it, we, it, like, I'm kind of just developing the firmware and we, and there's people in Oakland who are designing the hardware. Um, but anyone, once we have the hardware finished could order it could design could build it themselves actually and deploy them and then would keep track of it in their own way so it's kind of like this is just a technology and it's not a, a network necessarily if that makes sense to, to kind of split those two up in theory people who work on disaster radio could eventually deploy a real disaster radio network um, but yeah, and then in that at that time make a map, but it's not uh, not currently. So is that it right now <laughs> for the questions? Um, and just uh, one a previous question is: Disaster Radio it doesn't use IP addresses. And so that's that is correct. Yeah, that's a uh, oh uh, going back to this page. Uh, where was it? So, oh yeah, here, addresses. So in this page, it doesn't use IP addresses, that's correct. It has its own 
uh, addressing scheme. The scheme is actually based on the MAC address of the Wi-Fi uh, interface on the device. So it has it has a Wi-Fi interface you can connect to with normal Wi-Fi internet. Um, and then using that address, since it's going to be unique pretty much on, especially if you're that they're all the same uh, device, you can just take the 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 bottom part of the MAC address, the last, and then we yeah the last four bytes, and use that as the LoRa address essentially, the disaster radio address. So it, it is different, and it it's not. It's not directly interoperable with uh, internet, normal internet, mostly because it would be incredibly slow at running normal internet. If that, that, I think maybe that's what the question earlier about interoperability was kind of getting at, is that it wouldn't, it doesn't like translate normal internet to LoRa and then send it far and then un, you know, then deconvert it, you know, reconvert it into normal internet. It's not, it doesn't work like a bridge like that because LoRa is very low bandwidth. So it's not uh, not possible for, it'd, it'd be very slow. It'd be like dial up speeds. Um, okay, so. So continuing with where we were, um, I guess. So proactive and reactive routing, yeah. So, okay, I talked about that as far as disaster radio kind of uses a hybrid of those. Um, so this is a network example, an example of a routing protocol. So we have, this is a very simple, just one hop all the way through. There's no branching or anything, just to kind of give an idea of what, from Ari's perspective, what the network looks like. And so, and this is, I'll get a little bit more into distance vector routing versus other types of routing. This is kind of from a distance vector routing perspective. But you can see that he's one hop from Benny and one hop from Gabby. And that he's also two hops from Don via Benny. So one hop, two hops. And similarly for Fitz and Aaron, he can also see that he gets there through either Benny or Gabby as there's only two initial hops. So that shows up here where he knows how many hops he is, but he, this is essentially his route is to go to Benny to get to Don or to get there, go, go to Gabby to get to Fitz. So that's the basic premise of a routing table. Um, and it can obviously get more complicated if more nodes and more routes are added. So if a route is added here, maybe going this way is better for various reasons for Ari to get to Don. And so instead he would use this route. Um, so, so once you have that routing table that we saw here, but how do you use that? How do you forward packets to Benny and Gabby in this case? So distance vector routing is kind of how that routing table was built actually, and it uses an uh, algorithm called Bellman Ford algorithm. Um, and I can talk about that more if people are interested in kind of knowing how that works. Um, but the essential premise of distance vector routing, in addition to using Bellman Ford to determine the shortest path, is that it's kind of called like tell your neighbors about your neighbors. Um, so you just tell everyone around you this is who is around me. And then that way, once everyone in the network does that, eventually the network will converge and everyone has a route to everyone else. Um, because just enough people told everyone who was next to them. It's kind of like a game of telephone and you pass along who's next to you, who's next to you, who. And in that way, you get a route to everyone, but you don't necessarily get a full map of the network. It should be clear that you're only telling who's around you're not telling you're not telling everyone who's your neighbor you're just telling your neighbors that you're who your neighbors are um so that's 
uh, let me see. I think I have an example of it right here. So to explain that a little bit better, um, that in this case, Ari's neighbors with Gabby and Benny. So he would he would tell Ari would tell Gabby, hey, Benny's my neighbor. So you or or well, let me let me do it the other way. <laughs> so Ari would tell Benny that Gabby is his neighbor. So then Benny knows, okay, I can get to Gabby through here, through Ari. And so in that case, then Benny knows that Gabby is one hop away. So this is, let me see if I can. So from Ari's perspective, the network, he has only one direct, two direct connections, one to Benny and one to Gabby, and everything else has to go through one of those two. And you can see in this case, this is where the difference is. It's kind of ga kind of a game of spot the difference. Uh, is that here in the real network, Don is actually connected to Aaron, but Ari doesn't necessarily know that. He he doesn't really care. He just wants to get his packet to Benny so that Benny can figure out how to get it to Aaron. So by sending it along this path, Ario just sends it to Benny, and then Benny on ben, on the next hop, Benny then knows, okay, to get to Aaron, I have to send it to Don. So this is the network from Benny's perspective, which is e equally the same sort of naive view of the network where he, he doesn't know, in his case, how to get to Fitz. Same, it's the same sort of thing on the other uh, as Ari saw for getting to Aaron. So this is trying to illustrate the naive nature of distance vector, where you don't have a full idea of what the network actually looks like. You only have an idea of who, how to get to someone. The, your next, you only know your next hop. So there's another algorithm that's uh, also common. Pretty, pretty much distance vector and link state routing are the two main algorithms that are used or, or methods, methodologies. For what it's worth, uh, Disaster Radio uses is more distance vector based. I, I, when I designed it, it was more uh, just more familiar with those, and it and it's a little more dynamic, I guess, a little more uh, seems less less rigid, less structured than link state. I guess I don't I don't know a whole ton about link state routing because it's it's I just haven't used the protocols it's used in. I guess, but. The general premise is that it, it's tell everyone in the world about your neighbors. So it's it's more like you flood the network with your uh, with your routing table, your neighbor table. So you just tell everyone in the network. Eventually, everyone gets your 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 who your neighbors are, and using that can build a full map of who's connected to who in the network. Um, so the the kind of drawback of this is a lot more. Uh, overhead as far as keeping track of the network and changes in the network. It's, le it's a little less uh, on the fly, I guess. <laughs> um, and it uses uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, which is uh, similar to Bellman Ford. Um, and we, it's another one I can go in deeper uh, if people are interested. So I don't know if there's any more questions, Gary, or if I can should keep going here. Yeah, I have a quick uh, question. Oh. So earlier I was asking about how um, devices connect because in a scenario where I drive out to a location with a truck mm -hmm. and I hop out, set up my device, the way you're describing it, I'm, get, I'm understanding that each person who wants to be able to connect to this kind of network needs to have one of your software-defined uh, radio boards in order to actually connect to and act, um, participate in the network. Um, is that how that works? Or is there a bridging device where I go out there in my truck, put that system up, and then go to a different location, kind of like a repeater, mm -hmm. where anyone who connects to this network, which um, I, I might have missed that, if the network itself is ad hoc, then they can connect. But those devices are doing um address assignments and um uh generating lists of devices on the network is that is that can is that how that works uh yeah yeah so 
I guess to th yeah, you would. So no matter what, you need the Laura transceiver. Um, if you had a repeater, you could set up a hub and a repeater sort of setup, and that hub. So the Zastero does it. It does bridge Wi-Fi to Laura, um, and it could repeat over uh, intermediate connection. So yeah, I guess to answer your question, it would be yeah, but you do need. It's, and it's also, it's not a software defined radio. Laura is a, a it's a, a, a chip um, that is, I think it's, I can't remember who designs it or some tech or it's, it's a, it's an, uh, an actual uh, uh, SOC chip, I think, or maybe not that much, but just, um, so as long as you have that, then you could either talk on the lower network or if there's already a disaster radio, say, say set up somewhere, people around it could connect to Wi-Fi and then send messages over it um, in the kind of hub scenario. So I don't know if that answers your question a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay. Going back to what else? Okay, so this is kind of getting a little bit more. This is different from this is another option uh, that Disaster really doesn't use, um, but it's called source routing. Um, and it's essentially the source of the packet says, This is the route I want it to take. I want the route to go, you know, a certain path regardless of what one, some intermediate node thinks is the best path. Um, so where in, in traditional routing scenarios, each node in the route determines the next best, the best next hop. So and like we said in, uh, I don't know if I had, in this example, if R, Benny forwards a packet to Ari, Ari then decides Okay, which which path do I want to take? In this, uh, let me see if I have this. Uh, where was the? I don't know where. I thought I drew it here, but in this one, if there's a other path here, so Ari would get to decide which packet. Even if Gabby forwarded a packet here, it would then it would be up to Ari to decide which one of these is the best path to get to one of these two nodes down here down a uh, Don and Aaron. Um, so that's whereas in source routing, Gabby would say, no, I want it to go, I want to go Ari, Benny, Don, Aaron, regardless of if this extra node I added here is actually a better route. So that's that's generally how source routing is should be thought of. Um, and so then uh, a metric is kind of a, an important uh, concept to understand when talking about routing protocols. So a lot of times if you're looking at kind of uh, the algorithms, like the Bellman Ford or Dijkstra's algorithm, they talk about the cost of, uh, of a link or an edge. There's a lot of times you'll hear that term to describe a link when you're talking about the algorithm, algorithmic way of thinking of it. And uh, the metric is essentially the cost of a route. And in disaster radio, this is done by observing packet loss. So if in between if if a packet is missed, and this is very similar to a Ryan call Ryan protocol called Babel, Babel. Um, but and that's where it was inspired by, is that it listen, it watches all the packets that are happening between two nodes. And if it misses a packet, it says, I had packet loss. I'm going to lower my metric by you know one notch. And if I keep missing packets, I'm going to keep lowering my metric by one, one notch until I, my metric is just zero. It's, I, and I drop that route completely. I, I must have lost a connection, essentially. So it keeps track of packets with using a sequence number. And that sequence number then is used to create the metric that determines how the, the quality 
or the cost of that route. Um, so, and that is essentially in, in disaster radio, it ideally is used to, uh, to determine the best path along with the hop count. So if you know the shortest, you want the shortest uh, route and then you want the best quality route also. Um, so that that's how the metric is used. Um, and then I have some additional stuff. I guess I can now might be, people might be interested in seeing the simulator of the network. Um, unless there's questions before I jump into that. And I have, um, yeah, so. Oh, yeah, there's definitely questions in the live stream. OK. So you can answer those a little bit, and then they show it. Cool. Um, I'll kind of start with the, the most recent. How can it determine whether a packet has been lost or not? Uh, is it like TCP, I, TCP, where the nodes confirm which packets have been received? So that's that's a, a really good question. It, so it does not have any kind of acknowledgment. Um, so in TCP, particularly TCP, not UDP, there's a kind of handshake that happens. That is That does not happen in disaster radio, mostly due to uh, bandwidth usage, airtime usage of the network kind of uh, overhead. Um, with a limited packet size, it, it's not uh, reasonable to do that. And um, the, the, but to how it is done, in that case is I can show, I can skip ahead a bit. Um, so this is the header. And in this, there is a sequence number. So this sequence number is used and it's incremented. So every, every edge, I guess, every link from a neighboring node. So there's a sender and there's a receiver of each packet. And they have a sequence number associated with that link. And every time a packet is sent, that sequence number is incremented. And so the receiver then says, if I miss a sequence number from the sender, I am I dropped a packet, essentially. Um, so it, it's on the receiver end. So the sequence, the sender has a, they have a sequence number, increments it, and the receiver listens. And if it misses one, the packet was missed, lost. Um, so yeah. Cool. Um, and then from Brian, uh, do you think your routing model might eventually work with devices uh, with SDR type capabilities? I.e., it could mesh, be a mesh network that bridges more uh, heterogeneous uh, transceivers, not just Nora. What can they call cognitive radio? That's interesting. I haven't considered software defined radio too much. Um, I th think it would be possible. Bull. But so the protocol is general purpose. It's separated from the LoRa. So it's called LoRa Layer 2 because that's what it was designed to use. Um, but it's also Layer 2. So LoRa could actually be switched out. Um, I don't know about using software defined radio to actually talk Laura. I don't know if anyone's done that. Uh, it would be cool if someone had, if it's possible, uh, to basically reverse engineer Laura since it Laura is, I think, a proprietary uh, modulation scheme. Or and I know the the chip I think is proprietary. Um, so yeah, the, the the protocol can be decoupled from the in the physical network. That's how it was designed, and that. When I showed the simulators, the simulators are running the actual protocol that's also runs on the uh, hardware. So that uh, that answers that question, I think. Um, yeah, there's probably maybe you could follow up in the live stream chat. Um, also, um, there were there were some thoughts around uh, DVR. It might not be ideal for mobile mesh networks. Um, there's a bit of a back and forth mm -hmm. there, but do you have thoughts on that? 
Uh, it, as far as distance vector running being, or uh, I, I don't have strong opinions on it. I know there is some back and forth, and a lot of people like uh, DSR, like dynamic source routing, which is another sort of a popular ad hoc uh, routing protocol that I'm a little bit familiar with and have tried to take parts of specifically for some of the uh, reactive routing uh, aspects. So I, I have a certain agreement that distance vector is somehow sometimes limited as far as, I think the reason it's not a huge problem is because Bellman Ford, a lot of times like the, the algorithm is uh, criticized for being slow or being uh, not scalable. But I would say that it, on the scale that these networks actually are going to be, so I'd say that it might need to be there. You can have distance vector on a small scale. And then once you get to a larger geographic area, maybe have different, uh, basically clusters of meshes. So you kind of go into that more decentralized model where there's in there, in, but there maybe is a, there's multiple connections between those clusters. Um, that is something we, I was like, I was researching a couple months ago when I was more heavily working on this <laughs> in, in May. Uh, and I just didn't get to the point of implementing some sort of uh, more cluster-based model. But I think that's kind of what they're getting at is the, probably the scalability uh, drawbacks of distance vector routing. So. Cool. I think uh, everyone's eager to see the, the simulator. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's gonna it's running right now. I guess I'll. Uh, how do I share my screen? Share an external video. Is that what I do now? How do I do this? Can I? Oh, it's over here. That's right. It's the other button that's different from the other buttons. Okay. So. Okay. So can you see that? Let's see. Cool. Uh, so this is my desktop, <laughs> but um, I hope this is not too choppy since it's, you know, video kind of, um, but you can see right now there's a similar network to the one that was shown or actually I'll show it later, but if we want to, but you can see right now that all these nodes, seven of them, I think are chirping along and this is showing it in the um, proactive routing mode where they're still sending packets, uh, constantly broadcasting to just their neighbors, their routing tables. So all these little packets that are going can slow this down actually. Um, oh, let me see if I can open this back. Um, and if you look at these, I'm gonna turn off the broadcast visual because it gets a little cluttered. Um, but you can see in this, each one has a routing table um, that they've built up as I've been sitting here talking. Um, and if there were any changes, I guess it would it would adjust. Um, so and you can see, so if I want to, so there is a route from zero to six. And if I want to test that, uh, sending a packet actually, I will do that now. So. This is also, so the kind of cool thing about the simulator, like I was saying, it it actually, it is the real, not only just the real routing protocol, but it's it's almost the same firmware entirely. There's slight differences to get it to run on Linux essentially, um, but it this it's the same console that you could access if you had a physical device. Um, and I want to eventually, something I didn't get to out of this uh, discussion, is to actually be able to access a, a you know demo web app type of thing or have it more a little more integrated. So right now you have to actually use SoCat to, to kind of virtually uh, console into the, the simulated nodes. But in this case, if I want to send a node from this is node zero here, ABA to the 
node six one d five four four. You just I type in here one d five four four one four six. There is a way I can pull up the routing table on here, but it's a little janky right now, and I need to fix it. So I say hello from one, and it should it actually sends. Oh, here let me do this. So it, it did get the packet eventually, but it didn't show the routes because I had the routes turned off. So you didn't get the, the wow factor. Um, um, so you get a question about the visuals that we're seeing. Um, the little icons? Um, yes. Like the kernel, like The what, emojis? Yeah, like what, what are they representing? Those are the packets. So <laughs> the, the little emojis you're seeing are packets, and they, they're just randomly generated. <laughs> uh, and I think I originally I wanted to make them so if they're like the same, they would always be the same emoji. Um, but I don't think I don't know, I can't remember if that worked or not. Um, one B five four four one four six. I should copy that. Hello again. So now you should see it. But let me try here. I don't know if it's the curse of live demos. Um, is let me uh, so let me try from here. But this is, I mean, it's a little bit s still always a work in progress, like anything. So there you go. Now you saw the route. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show. So you can see the route it actually took that single emoji to get from here to there. Um, so that's that's essentially how it's used. There's more features that I would like to add, things like adjusting a, a metric or something. You can also see in here that I did get that packet here, hello, or I did, I should have gotten it, but I don't know why I didn't. I think this node had a problem here. I may have, may have broken this node. So that's a simulator. Um, yeah, if you need some work if anyone wants to help out. <laughs> uh, so I guess if I can go back to the presentation and and see if there's anything else people want to ask questions about, or if there's anything on the simulator people want to or interested or curious about. Um, yeah, just uh, also being mindful of time as well. There are a few questions uh, in yeah. the chat. Um, do you know the ratio between network information and traffic as percentage of maximum bandwidth and how uh, that relates to network that is static versus rapidly changing topology and convergence? Oof. That's, a, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of questions. Um, as far as bandwidth usage, uh, the first part of that, is that in the chat? As far as it was just a lot. Uh, the ratio of network information traffic is percentage of ban ban bandwidth. Max, <laughs> max bandwidth. Yeah, um, that is a good question. I know that there's a duty cycle in uh, the, at least in Europe and I think in the, I think in the US, I'm not sure about it, but the, a uh, 10% transmit time of a duty cycle is um, what the regulations say you're supposed to use. Um, and the protocol, the, the firmware has uh, the ability to observe that. As far as what that maximum bandwidth is, I, I don't know off the top of my head, could do some calculations as far as I think it's, I think the, um, I know that the it's 125. I don't remember what it is, but 125. I can't. I can't remember. So, <laughs> um, but there is there's a the LoRa um, frequency has an allocated bandwidth um, for each channel, um, and then I guess you would just have to do a calculation based on okay with the duty cycle. And then how much can I transmit based on that duty cycle and given this bandwidth? Um, so you could do the calculation, but I don't have it ready. There's actually like a 
there's like a Google Doc somewhere. I should like sh I, I'll I'll put it in the the live stream chat. I'll find it that like gives you that calculation. Cool. And then there's a question about uh, if it's a solar powered uh, system that's simply intermittent operation, as in go to sleep and awake frequently. Yeah, that's um, that's another good question. It could be designed that way. It. Currently, so someone actually just made a, a modification or, or a, a pull request to the, the LoRa library that the simulator interfaces with and to actually put it into deep sleep mode, which is energy saving mode, and it can wake up when it receives a packet. So we have, we're kind of getting there as far as that capability, and I think... If I'm guessing what the most recent hardware holdup was, I think it was to get that feature, <laughs> that pin connected correctly, <laughs> as far as making deep sleep possible, because that's obviously yeah, a, a concern or thought when you're talking about solar's powered stuff is energy conservation. So um, yeah, I guess that is the... Um, and just a clarification on the uh, the maximum bandwidth question. Um, how much traffic it is just to maintain the network topology versus actual user content packets? Ah, so that is goes back to that proactive and reactive. So in the simulator I was showing, it was doing the proactive, just constantly blasting packets. Um, that's not necessary. So there, in, there in theory shouldn't be any need for uh, control packets, control messages, as far as it taking up bandwidth. But network does converge faster and updates faster if you have that turned on, essentially. Um, so you, you can run it without any overhead and only sending message with, messages with meaningful data. Um, so that's kind of something that I've been meaning to implement is as far as like a maybe the node could keep track of the most busy times or you highest usage of traffic. And then since it doesn't because it doesn't have a, a, a clock, obviously like an on a real time clock, it would just know that okay, you know, right now is going to be a slow time, or maybe after so many minutes or some sort of count of it it hasn't transmitted a packet, then it so, or hasn't heard a packet, then it sends a control message. So it more intel intelligently uses the the time that it has. So for you know, say at night, it actually sends that. You could even, I mean, depending on your setup, maybe you could connect it to a device. You know, there could be another uh, device involved that triggers something based on a real time clock. You know, um, yeah, there, there's potential for that sort of thing. Um, and then there's uh, another question about uh, what are you planning on using in production resilient disaster rate networks uh, in terms of what trade-offs uh, make sense uh, for your use case threat model? Um, what are you planning using in production re resilient disaster rate networks? Oh, uh, I understand uh, the question. Um, I don't have a good answer for that, I guess. I would say, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I like the proactive just because it seems like it, it, I trust it more, basically, based on, I, I feel like it, I tested that more, whereas the reactive, I wrote more recently. So from a developer perspective, I'm kind of like, oh, go with the thing that is more surefire, more going to work. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I inherently lean towards proactive, but I could, I don't, yeah, I, it's not really my call. It's going to be something that's configurable for, by every user, actually. Um, and as far as like 
we don't currently there's no sort of uh, root protection on the device. It's something that maybe we need to add as far as if a, if someone distributing these devices wants to say, you know, configure it a certain way so that everyone in this area is, you know, if there's, if we're looking at this from like a network administrator perspective and doesn't want anyone just constantly into it or telnetting into it and changing stuff, um, you know, you could, you could, there's potential for that, that someone designs it that way. But currently the way it is, any given node can decide how it wants to behave, whether it wants to behave proactively or reactively. Cool. Um, I have a feeling that this is going to spur more conversation <laughs> in the live chat and elsewhere. So uh, I wonder, uh, is there kind of some parting um, thoughts around this discussion that you want to close on? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess if people are you know, my big thing is if people are interested in it, uh, the best way to get involved is to help out develop or build things or just once we have hardware, get the hardware and try it out yourself and, you know, uh, you know, set it up, I guess. I don't have like a good, you know, quick pitch, um, but definitely, you know, the best way to me to contribute is to keep like look at what the open issues are on GitHub and and see if you can get some input so it's not just me answering all the bugs, <laughs> which it currently is, which is fine. I just have a day job also, so this isn't this isn't what I do full time. <laughs> so I'll also plug that this is the the unit. Oh, you have one. Yeah. Where, why do you have that? How, did I give that to you guys? I did believe. You, oh, you got it from maybe from DWeb. Uh, maybe DWeb. Maybe some other. Uh, yeah, I used I used those. Like, That's it. Yeah. I don't even, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even have one here. They're all like downstairs. <laughs> I like, don't have one little thing to show. I'm not gonna run down and get it. But yeah, that's what it looks. That's what. That's the old. That's the ESP32. You don't want to use that. It doesn't even. It doesn't even run the current firmware. So throw it out. <laughs> Keeping it for our historical. <laughs> actually, I didn't, I didn't use it. Actually, the LoRa transceiver is actually is the pinout for that LoRa transceiver is useful if you want to add another LoRa transceiver. That's actually something I didn't mention uh, that is related to Ryan that I haven't really thought about mostly, is that Disaster Radio will plan on having two LoRa transceivers that could operate at different frequencies or different spreading factors. There's a there's a it's kind of work operates similar to to channels if, if that's kind of another going deeper into LoRa but um, so having two uh, transceivers then kind of gives you even more complicated routing questions as far as which which route which uh, antenna do I forward on or do we have one that's a transmit one that's receives then you have duplex communication which would be cool that's what I wanted to do but I think the people who designed the hardware might have had different ideas because they didn't use the same antennas. I don't, that's that's a <laughs> different question. They didn't use the same transceivers, so they're different powers. So they won't actually brought like you can't use them as a duplex. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, um, I think uh, are we cool to wrap up? Yeah, I think I mean I'm good. I can hop in the chat and try and uh, chat with people there. I'm glad people were throwing in questions and stuff. It was nice. Yeah. Awesome. So, Great. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, everybody.